Going again, and who are we here with? I'm, I'm also your co host Omeat, and today we're going to be talking about Palestine from the river to the sea, is what we titled the show. Mm-hmm. And La Voz del Pueblo. So we, we, um, we titled it that because it covers a ge- uh, uh, geography, and we have a geographer as our guest today. So you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, thank you for having me. My name is Dr. Linda Kikivish. On the, on the streets, I'm known as Kiki. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm a geographer. I have a PhD in geography from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And my entire research when I was doing that doctorate was on the borders of Palestine. So, yeah, very apt conversation from the river to the sea. Yeah. And, you know, we, we, we heard this in the... In, in the demonstrations, right? Like that was one of the, the chants mm-hmm. in the demonstrations. And, you know, it, it, it really encompasses where we're talking about, mm-hmm. you know, when we look at, at Palestine. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I was watching, you know, I see footage of, you know, of people like being pressed up against the sea, you know, yeah. and from the border, you know, over. Yeah. So, um, what is your... How did you get interested, or how how do, how 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 is this important? Mm-hmm. Like what's what's happened there in the from in the geographical area in in Palestine? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's an interesting story how I got involved because there there is no reason for me to have gotten involved. I'm not Palestinian or Muslim or Jewish or Christian, or and that's I'm from this side of Mother Earth, mm-hmm. um, from the people of the Maiz, and that's the people of the wheat. You know, and the way that I got involved was mostly by just seeing free Palestine everywhere and being confused about it in the late 90s, early 2000s, actually the early 2000s, because I started to connect with all of these movements. Um, They were being called anti-globalization, but they're really alter globalization, a different kind of globalization that we're struggling for. A globalization that weaves the world with respect of difference rather than the globalization of capital, which is the imposition of sameness. Everybody becoming a consumer, everybody becoming like a a waged worker Mm -hmm. and all the land being used for extractive purposes and people just getting shuffled into cities and being totally dependent on capitalism in order to survive. And so as I was studying globalization and these movements is when I first learned and saw the word, the letters E Z L N, the mm-hmm. Zapatistas, mm-hmm. and Free Palestine everywhere. But um, I didn't really feel comfortable asking folks about Palestine who were there um, because I wanted to go through the process myself because I had known about Israel as a kid with the Diary of Anna Frank, and it was a, a huge heartbreak for me to realize how Israel had been created mm. by the destruction of Palestine. I hadn't been told that. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of us probably growing up here aren't told that part. Right. And so when I entered the geography doctoral program at UNC, I was actually going to do my entire research on the Mexico-Guatemala border. Okay. Because I wanted to know, like, what's the history of this border? Mm-hmm. And it was starting to look a lot like Mexico-U.S., in terms of the fortifications, the security, U.S. technology advice to fortify that border to curb migration from Central America. So we're talking about Chiapas and Guatemala. Chiapas and Guatemala, exactly. Yeah, because yeah, the border is very long, too, yeah. up in the north. So, yeah, specifically Chiapas and Guatemala, where there's a lot of these these uh, cartel routes or routes that cartels want to take over. Mm-hmm. Um And I ended up switching my entire topic to the borders of Palestine because I had learned at the same time about Rafah crossing, Ghazze, through a blog that I was reading called Ghazza Mom, written by Leila Haddad, who I later became friends with. Um, She just happened to live in Durham in North Carolina, and I was nearby. Yeah, because her husband was doing his residency at Duke University, and so then... It was really great to meet her in person after having just read her entire blog one night and had my entire heart shredded. And when I switched over to Palestine to look at the borders, I had to look at the history of how maps were created. So I learned about how it became from the river to the sea. Mm -hmm. And I learned about how Palestine got the borders that we know of today largely through, you know, we know a lot of um, the shape of Palestine through the artwork 
Mm-hmm. And what I, what I saw was the cutting up of the world in that region, the way that had happened to us. Right. So when I went to Palestine to study that, that struggle and learn from that struggle, every single moment I had this question in my heart of why does it matter to me? Why mm-hmm. do I care? Mm-hmm. How is it related? Mm-hmm. And I just kept seeing us and feeling us. You know, in refugee camps, you know, little kids running around like that's us in the hoods, you know, yeah. like, you yeah. know, people taking care of each other. Everybody knows who you are. Okay, there's gossip, of course, of you course. know, like at the, at the end of the day, everyone's <laughs> the cheese man, right? Like everyone's going to take care of each other. And so I felt um, a lot of affinities, but I didn't know how to talk about them yet. So, so much of my process with accompanying the Palestinian struggle has been trying to figure out how it ties to ours. And that actually, it it led me to that in studying the borders of Palestine. I ended up tracing it back, this whole question of borders, Mm -hmm. because that's what had interested me. Right. I ended up tracing it back to 1492 without even knowing that I would. Mm -hmm. So... Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's the story that that's where I like to start when I talk about Palestine. Most of the time, the story begins um, when Palestine is colonized by the Europeans in the late 19th century, which is a, a good place to, to start. Of course, yeah. what we miss if we don't add other starting points or other, other facets or angles is that it kind of starts looking as if it's just a very narrow, unique conflict mm-hmm. place, you know? historically peculiar Jerusalem is there you know and and that it doesn't really have anything to do with the rest of the world which I refused to believe Mm -hmm. and starting our culture with like the the Mexican Empire oh yeah starting there like there's all this thousands of years of history uh, yeah and 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 that is so new you know 500 Mm -hmm. years is nothing compared to thousands of years of life that our ancestors have created on these lands and how there weren't borders on these lands at all you know, if you trace the maize, the maize, and how, you know, follow the maize all over the continent, all over these lands, it's up and down. And that, that signals human migration. It's not just maize, because maize can't grow without human hands, you know. We've grown, we've grown up together. That's why we are called the people of the maize, you know. Mm-hmm. So this question of borders was really important to me. It was something that within the academic studies of Palestine, it wasn't really being questioned it was mostly it was taken for granted that those are the borders and so now we need to struggle from the starting point of those borders there was very few studies even like i loved every single one and cherished of the of the the times that you know of palestine before those borders and how did society live and interact you know between syria and lebanon today you know the jordan palestine egypt those borders weren't there a hundred years ago a little over 100 years ago and when they were cut it split a lot of communities and families in those mm. circuits and has created a whole new territory yeah like here you know like guatemala mexico border divided mayan people mm-hmm. um in you know mexico in the u.s the, the honoodam apache like these borders divide people yeah you know and then you have english speaking now um the honoodam in the u.s and then spanish speaking honoodam in the, in the Mexico side. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and in Mexico, my 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 community is the Mam, the Maya Mam community, and that that community was cut by the Chiapas Guatemala border, mm-hmm. and after the Mexican Revolution, um, there was a whole Mexicanization campaign, like creating the nation of Mexicans rather than recognizing that there's a lot of nations already. You know, and have their own histories and their own languages, yeah. but the Mexicanization campaign post Mexican Revolution really discouraged any other language except for Spanish. Mm-hmm. And so the Mam people on the Mexican side no longer speak Mam, and the Mam people on the Guatemala side, we do still speak Mam. But you see that, 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 that change that happens just with this border that is so arbitrary. Mm-hmm. And the way that I understand borders from this history, it really is contracts between colonizers still. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, like that's how the first border started in 1494, just two mm-hmm. years after 1492. 
And then after that, that was like the entire logic that we have today. In, and and it's sometimes not just the physical um, differences, I guess, or the, the physical borders. And because uh, you know, I've been reading lately on on um, what is uh, Israeli food, mm -hmm. which is Palestinian food that they've co-opted, and like now it's Israeli food. Mm -hmm. You know, like um, the the use of, of of many different things, right? And so now you go to an Israeli restaurant, but you, what you're eating is mostly Palestinian food. Yeah. You know, so there's a lot of things that colonialism does, mm -hmm. and those borders, is that you know the colonizers then like, oh, no, this is ours now. Yeah. 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 They they not only steal land, they also steal our foodways, our every you know what what our ancestors have created, what we've created. Um, so with the case actually with Israel Palestine, it's often talked about as kind of kind of the ones that are most unique uh, colonial settler colonial projects that are more unique because they don't unlike like South Africa for example mm -hmm. that wanted to separate white people and black people right. spatially but allow black people into white communities just for the day to work, to work. and then go back home mm -hmm. right like they needed their labor in South Africa. In Palestine, that, that's no longer the case since a long time ago. And so there's a lot of importation of labor from Asia, for example. And so a lot of the time folks call, um, call Israel-Palestine a situation where the settlers are not trying to extract from the colonized, except that they are, even if it's not labor. Because they're extracting, as you're saying, all of this beautiful creation of food, food ways. I mean, the songs, the music, the dress, everything. It's right. it's really, um, I don't know if pathetic is the way. It's, it's pathetic and it's a bunch of other emotions like when you see it, you know. Well, I think that's part of the, the structure of what's going on right now is that, all right, we don't need your labor anymore. Leave. Yeah. Disposable population. Yeah, like leave. We're just, well, and... You know, when you demolish buildings and everything, it's just getting them ready for new construction. Totally. Like, all right, we're going to, with bombs, you just destroy everything. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to build whole new construction once you're gone. Yeah. And s slowly pushing them and then threatening Egypt and, you know, a bunch mm -hmm. of different things. So. Yeah. <coughs> <coughs> so, in, um, in, in all of this, you know, obviously... Most folks know about Palestine because from from October seventh forward, mm -hmm. right? But this has been going on for a long time, and you know you have different things that have happened. You know, nineteen forty eight, and you know a lot of different dates um, of things that have happened in Palestine. Um, what do you think is uh, probably what's led to what we what we're seeing right now? I mean, there's a lot of things, right? Mm -hmm. But you know, as far as territory and as far as, you know, what... Mm -hmm. I, I saw this map, and the map had a um, all the roads in Palestine, and they were colored, yellow, red, blue, uh, green, and there's roads for Palestinians, mm -hmm. there's roads for Israelis, um, there's roads, you know, and they don't cross each other. Mm -hmm. And so Palestinians can't drive on certain roads, um, and they can go to certain places. Mm -hmm. So when you look at like the West Bank, it's a bunch of little spots yeah. of Palestinians that to get from one spot to another, there's all these checkpoints and, mm -hmm. you know, and Palestinians, well, if they leave Palestine, they can't come back in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Maybe this is a good time to start from the beginning. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, our beginning, 1492, right? Yeah. Our apocalypse. Right. Um, that created the situation where the globe is now cut up into these borders and there is an erasure of people so that other peoples can make their lives. That's, yeah. So with, with 1492, it's interesting because usually we hear just about October 12th, which is when Columbus landed on the Caribbean, encountered the Taino people, immediately enslaved them and began a genocidal campaign. Mm -hmm. And then later comes to us in 1521. We don't hear about what's going on internally with Europe that much. You know, mm -hmm. it kind of just feels like, oh, they had it all together and they came over here and, right. you know, and they didn't have it all together. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of warring for a very long time. I mean, the situation in medieval Europe was one of enslavement called, you know, serfdom, mm -hmm. or, you know, feudalism. Whereas, you know, with formal enslavement, there's the master and the slave. 
um, and the slave has absolutely zero life other than what the master decides. With with feudalism, which which is what progressed in Europe after slavery, mm -hmm. with feudalism, there is zero land that people actually like can use without a lord, mm -hmm. without a lord having owned it, and so they can live on it, but they have to give pay the lord tribute. You know, they they they're not free, and they're constantly being they were they were constantly being forced to labor, as if they were enslaved. Mm -hmm by by the lords and then after that is the progression to capitalism and capitalism was understood as a, uh, like a revolution like it's you know free you can be free now mm -hmm. to choose where you want to sell your labor mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be just the lord you know so there's been within europe for centuries this this master slave um above and below logic and practice of like people can't just be different someone has to be your boss you know like there's like a whole culture of someone needs to be a boss and i need to be a worker right rather than like why can't you just be you why can't everybody just be you whoever you, whoever you're going to be and so when they come in uh 1492 something had just happened that that was pretty it became monumental in the history of the creation of the europe that we know of today so the europe that we know of today modern Europe was birthed, they say, in either 1492 or a little bit earlier in 1453. In 1453, because Constantinople, which had been the, the seat of the, the final Roman Empire, formal mm -hmm. Roman Empire, had just fallen <clears throat> to the Ottoman Empire, the Muslims, over in the east. And there was Islam also over to the west, over in the Iberian Peninsula for centuries. So Islam had, you know, been on both sides of th this idea of mm -hmm. Europe, which is just a place on the continent of Eurasia, but likes to call itself its own continent. <laughs> 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 and created itself as like the direct opposite of Africa, too. So like whiteness and blackness, like, like a lot of this, like... Mm existed way before they even learned about us and yeah. came here. And in 1492, on January, tw on January 2nd, which was before, a few months before, obviously, Oct October 10th, that same year, though, the, there was a huge battle that ended Islamic rule in the Iberian Peninsula um, by Queen Isabella, who was the patron of Columbus. Queen Isabella was a hardcore Catholic monarch, very close with the Pope, very close with Rome, mm -hmm. and um, was apocalyptic in her thinking. Like, she really believed that everybody needs to be one way, and that is Catholic, and that there's just a, that one version of the world. Mm -hmm. And so everyone needs to follow that world, or they need to leave. So either you convert, or you leave, if you're not Catholic. So immediately after January 2nd, uh, there was a huge ethnic cleansing of Judaism and Islam throughout decades and centuries of the Iberian Peninsula to try to create this idea of Europe, you know, t so tied with Christendom. Mm -hmm. And so Columbus was there in Granada where the last battle took place, waiting for Granada to fall, and then spoke to Isabella after and told her, hey, Jerusalem next. Jerusalem next, I mean, after beating the Muslims, right? And, and, and it was Islamic Empire, the Mamluks who, had, uh, who, who were custodians of Jerusalem at the time, in 1492. Mm -hmm. So for the European imagination, which is so tied to Christendom, it is very tied to a biblical reading. Yeah. And a lot of it is yeah. apocalyptic. Mm -hmm. And the end of the world, the rapture, Armageddon, is supposed to take place in Jerusalem. So Jerusalem is, like the, is the goal for this holy war, which isn't called that, you know, Isabella's holy war and, and Rome's holy war on the planet, which we experienced then immediately after October 12, where we're forced to convert to Catholicism. Everyone was forced to convert. There was no, no respect of other worlds which was such a different situation from empires before. Like, you know, we hear about the Mexica Empire. And empires here, like, they, they didn't have this logic of destroying worlds. Right. 
they're, they're still tyrannical in that they're imposing <laughs> ways on others, mm -hmm. but they allowed other people to live their yeah. lives and keep their language and their modos and their costumbres and everything. It wasn't taking like imposing their whole culture, just taking like a mordida from it. Exactly. Just, just give me a little bit and I'll leave you alone. Yeah, like the Mam people, we had to grow cacao for, okay. the, for the Mexica Empire, yeah. you know, but, but we could still speak our language, we could still mm -hmm. live, right? Um, I'm not excusing it at all, but yeah. it's just to show it was a very different situation when we talk about empires, to, to be very specific about what is the end goal for this empire. When the Spanish came, the end goal for this empire was to create one single world right. where everybody fit, and if you don't fit, then you can't exist. Yeah. Or you're below me. Or you're below me, right, exactly. And, and they immediately came with their ranking system, their caste system, you know. Subhuman system. Subhumans, yeah, they had whole debates about whether we were humans or not. Mm -hmm. like, and these debates ended up um, influencing future empires like the British and the French and the Germans, you know, mm -hmm. um, because this had already been settled in the Americas over like what the human is and what the human's not, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and natives, we were allowed to like, we could assimilate, but it was Africans could not assimilate. Mm -hmm. and, well, they needed African enslavement, you know, mm -hmm. and so they just make things up and arbitrary things and like try to justify them juridically through law, through some kind of debate. But through, through religion? The theology, exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. So the theology of empire, mm -hmm. this empire that we're in, that theology, that spirituality understands that God just loves some and doesn't love others. Mm -hmm. There's just an above and a below. Mm -hmm. And that's just the way, that's just the way it is. Mm -hmm. And so it asks us to accept injustice as normal and as God given. And sadly, it works for some people. It doesn't yeah. work for others. So they come, and when Columbus heads back to the Iberian Peninsula after his first voyage, he lands in Portugal, and the Portuguese king uh, finds out about all this new loot and wants in on it. And so the Portuguese start fighting with Isabella and Ferdinand, and the Pope steps in because you can't be having these Catholics fight. How about we get together and invade the whole world? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Which was, that was exactly their thinking. Mm -hmm. So the Pope cuts a line called the Treaty of Tordesillas over in, like, on the Atlantic, and it hits that, the easternmost spot of Aviala, of Turtle Island, mm -hmm. which is where Brazil lands. And it says, everything that is east of this line, Portugal, you go invade. Everything west, Spain, you go invade. Mm -hmm. Which is why we speak Spanish, because mm -hmm. we were more west. Yeah. Right? And, in, and in what becomes Brazil, they speak Portuguese. And so that line introduces global linear thinking, which is the borders, modern borders. Mm -hmm. This idea that this is going to be a peaceful contract so you don't fight and you can invade different portions. You can control different portions. You can administer different portions of the globe. Amongst Europeans. Amongst, that's the key. <laughs> Amongst Europeans. We don't have a say. No, nobody on the ground had a say at all. It really right. was drawing yeah. a line on a map as if they were God. Mm -hmm. Right, like in the most abstract way, without considering how this was going to destroy life mm -hmm. on earth, on the ground. And so they continued and split up Aviala into vice royalties mm -hmm. so that their, um, the invaders could have their, you know, the territory that they would oversee. Mm -hmm. Those end up becoming like the vice royalty of New Spain. That's the first one. That one ends up becoming Mexico, mm -hmm. the state of Mexico, mm -hmm. right? And then, then and that gets, you know, with independence movements in the early 1800s, like, they start getting cut up into nation states, mm -hmm. into states. And then Europe starts cutting itself up in this mm -hmm. way, and it starts to also destroy its worlds internally. Mm -hmm. The unification of Germany, for example, which came pretty late in 1871, the unification of Italy, which also took place in the early 1870s, destroyed so much difference on those territories. Like, we don't, we don't hear about that. Like, we think Italian has always been the language of that land. No, 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 no. Italian was one language among many mm -hmm. on those lands, you know? But this logic of homogenizing space to make it easier to control and administer, it, it begins globally because of 1492, 1494, the Treaty of Tordesillas, we get cut up, the Europeans cut themselves up. And then Germany, because Germany comes in late, and already, you know, the, the Spanish and Portuguese empires have been replaced by, first, like, the Dutch East India Company, which was a big old corporation, and, like, the first corporation that we know, 
I mean in history. And then the British and the French start growing and Germany was like a bunch of uh, Germanies mm -hmm. <laughs> and becomes one Germany in 1871. And they want in on the game of empire and so they host a conference in Berlin to cut up Africa so that Germany can have some Africa. <laughs> mm. That's like, why Africa has all the straight lines. That's why Africa has all these straight lines. Yeah, and again, not asking <clears throat> anyone on the ground how this was going to affect them, not caring. I mean, asking in terms of like creating the situation where they would like formally create a treaty. <laughs> but right. you, we know about treaties over here yeah. too and how yeah. they're just not respected, which is again, these borders are between Europeans. When we've tried these borders between Europeans and Native Americans called treaties, mm -hmm. complete disrespect. Mm -hmm. It's just a formality just to, you know, create a semblance of quote-unquote yeah. peace right. for the colonizer. Mm -hmm. So during this time in, in the late 1800s, after Germany has host, you know, is hosting this Berlin conference, it's also called the Congo Conference because that's when the Congo gets gifted to King Leopold II. A single person gets to own the Congo, gets gifted by a European's gift to a single European, the Congo. And he uses it as his personal uh, rubber plantation, mm -hmm. which is, like, you know, when we think about the Congo, the Congo today is still understood, related to as a plantation, yeah. you know? Mm -hmm. So much of the world is related to as a plantation, so much of the land, you know? And those who are in the way are a nuisance and must be destroyed, removed, you know, genocided, it doesn't matter. Or, you know, if you want, then you can go flee to the city and maybe you can go find a job, you know. Mm -hmm. And it was around this time as Europe had cut itself up and trying to unify that it was destroying difference and persecuting difference. And our Jewish relatives were persecuted. Uh, horrible anti-Semitism that took place at around that time in the name of the nation state, in the name of creating a Germany, in the name of creating a France. Mm -hmm. And everybody had to be French, everybody had to be German, you know? And so a lot of folks being persecuted in Europe who didn't fit in were trying to find a place to live. And so the Zionist movement grew out of that in Europe to try to get just everyone to go to Palestine or to go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. At first it wasn't even Palestine, it was uh, Uganda. It was part of this whole cutting up of Africa, mm -hmm. you know? And sadly, what happened is that in order to be free, the persecuted of Europe had to go elsewhere to persecute others, which happened here too. Mm -hmm. A lot of folks persecuted by Europe over these last 500 years have come to these lands. And they have been able to shift context where they can now be above, whereas in Europe they're below. Now they can be above and someone else is there below. Mm -hmm. And so, and that's the whole logic of making our lives at, at the expense of other lives, you know, and that's the logic of empire. So with Palestine, the state of Israel was created to try to resolve Europe's internal contradiction about how racist right. it is instead of actually dealing with that fact, export it out, export, just like I would export it out. Mm -hmm. And, and so the state of Israel was created on top of Palestine through war in 1948. And there were lots of reasons for it. Uh, there still are so many reasons for it. There's not just one, one of them from the perspective of a lot of Christians, Christian Zionists, especially, is that that's the geography of Armageddon of the rapture and that the third temple needs to be built and the Messiah will return. And everyone will die in a fiery hell who does not get saved by Christ. So that's one huge reason. So like, you know, we, when things don't make sense about Palestine, a lot of it has to do with, you know, there's a huge existential relationship that mm -hmm. some people have to these lands, you know, Europeans especially. Um, and also Palestinians, like, like we know what it is to have an existential relationship to land, you know, as native peoples like that. We're not separate from land. And so their relation, of course, that's all sacred right. land. And so when the United Nations is created after the horrors of the Second World War to try to prevent more wars, another world war, the UN decides to divide up Palestine 
which the Europeans, the French and the British had just cut up mm -hmm. after you know, taking those lands in World War I. Just how they cut up Africa, just like they cut themselves up, just like they cut us up. Mm -hmm. and, and so then what happens is that, of course, the native population, Palestinians, say, no, <laughs> we're mm -hmm. not going to go live somewhere else like, just for, you know, this, for settlers to come. Like, you know, people can come if they're persecuted to live with us with respect, but not to try to take over like they're the landlord, you know? Yeah, there was a lot of that. There, there was, was a lot, lot of acceptance of that. A lot of acceptance, yeah, because all three Abrahamic faiths have lived in those territories for mm -hmm. a really long time, for centuries. And uh, under Islam, Christians and Jews are understood as people of the book, so they're like, and they're cousins. Mm -hmm. Everyone calls each other cousins, you know? It's just that other interests, in addition to you know, these Christian Zionist um, apocalyptic interests, uh, there are also these very material interests. Mm -hmm. There's a lot. There's a, there's a lot of oil. Like the global economy really functions because of the fuel, the energy of that part of the world mm -hmm. over the last century, and because so much of what's rewarded is profit in the society. If there's profit to be made, mm -hmm. then it's going to go get made no matter what. Mm -hmm. So Palestinians find themselves in the crossroads of so many different interests, uh, all colonial, spiritual, and material at the same time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because there is a lot of, um, uh, and I think it's, it's important to distinguish what a Zionist is, mm -hmm. you know, because I think that, you know, in the, in the rhetoric, sometimes um, folks uh, will be called anti-Semitic if you say, we criticize yeah. uh, um, Zionist. Or, or or Israel. Yeah. And I think that's really important to distinguish one from the other. Could you give a little bit of background on what that difference is? Yeah. So Judaism has existed for millennia. Mm -hmm. Zionism, in the way that we know it, has existed for about 150 years. Like, um, And Zionism is a, is a, as we know it, political Zionism is this idea that because Europe persecutes Jews everywhere they are, what needs to happen is that, and because Jews are a minority everywhere that they are, not a majority, mm -hmm. the idea with political Zionism was to bring Jews together as a majority somewhere. And at first it didn't matter where, it could be Uganda, it could be Argentina, but it ended up being Palestine because of the close connection with history and with spirituality. Mm -hmm. It's completely undeniable, absolutely. The idea, though, of creating a state where Jews can be safe uh, in theory, is great. We all want to be safe. Right. But in practice, it ended up being created on top of another world, on top of another people, without respecting others. And so then uh, there are a lot of our Jewish, re Jewish relatives who are not Zionists and have been trying to rescue Judaism from this kind of this takeover. The political takeover. The political takeover that... You know, there's a, a really wonderful Jewish liberation theologian named Mark Ellis who uh, wrote a book called Jewish Liberation Theology. He has a lot of books. And he talks about how after the Holocaust, there's this huge um, existential crisis with God. Like, how could you allow this, God? Right? Like, we're mad at you. Um, how can we still believe in you? And Zionism comes in and says, well, the state of Israel will never allow this to happen again. Mm. So kind of steps in in the role of protector mm. that, you know, God plays mm -hmm. or God is supposed to play. And so then that, that ends up getting a lot of strength, not initially, not in 1948 when Israel is created, but in 1967 after Israel goes to war and gets more land. Mm -hmm. And, and it seems like a miracle because it took only six days. So it's kind of like this biblical thing, you know, on the seventh day, God rested kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And so then that, in the Western imagination, kind of uplifts Israel as like this, this magical place. And, and that's when Christian Zionists, and there's so many more uh, Christian Zion, Zionists than there are Jewish Zionists. Yeah, because you hear like, people like, like Biden, you mm -hmm. know, admit and say... I am a Zionist. Even though he's not Jewish. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and yeah. say it doesn't matter where, there will always be, an, there, there needs to be an Israel. 
yeah, we'd create an Israel if she didn't exist, right? Like, yeah. it's a military base, like, from his yeah. perspective, you know, mm -hmm. from someone like Lindsey Graham, who's a senator, um, he comes from the Bible Belt, and in the Bible Belt, there's a lot of Christian fundamentalism, mm -hmm. and, and they believe that the land is theirs. And in fact, when I was doing this research on the borders of Palestine, I was convinced this is not religious, this is colonial, this is just straight up material, this is not mm -hmm. spiritual, it's material everywhere. But then I ended up having to read the Bible because it was through the Hebrew Bible, especially the book of Joshua after the Exodus, like what happens, how do you get that land? And it's a very genocidal book, it's really disturbing, yeah. but it's a very geographic book too, it's the most geographic book in the Hebrew Bible. And it lays out the promised land, like the limits of the promised land, you know. And in the 19th century, as the Ottoman Empire is falling, and now the prehistory of this is that the Crusades, you know, that the, 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 there had been Crusades before in the, you know, in the 12th century, 13th century, where the where the Christ, uh, the Christian Christendom from Europe tried to take Jerusalem. Right. They've been trying to take Jerusalem for a long time, you know. And when the Ottoman Empire was custodian of Jerusalem. It was very strong, and so Europeans didn't visit the, you know, as they call it, the Holy Land yeah. for centuries until the Ottoman Empire started to crumble and decline in the 19th century. And then they got really excited about it. Europeans, U.S. Americans, you know, Euro-Americans. I still mm -hmm. call them Europeans even though they're here. Yeah. And they, they became enchanted. The evangelicals became enchanted in, in particular and tried to prove their version of Christianity as the correct one but through science, through maps, mm -hmm. by mapping out where exactly the Red Sea parted, you know, by, ma by mapping out the uh, biblical stories as if they were literal, mm -hmm. which was also something very new. Mm -hmm. It's new in Islam today, too, a very literal reading of scripture rather than a metaphorical reading that can really help you with your life in the context you are in, which is a very different context than previous ones, right? right? In the 19th century, uh, evangelicals um, were beginning to really read this, the, the uh, scripture in a literal way. They wanted to map it. And so what I found out is that that shape of Palestine from the river to the sea that we have was actually a pure accident of history. Mm -hmm. Because the Holy Land, according to evangelicals, extends way far out than the River Jordan to the east, mm -hmm. even over to where modern-day Iraq is, to the Tigris and the Euphrates, mm -hmm. because that's like the birthplace of Abraham, right. of, you know, which is the, the founder. How far does it go? Like, what's the perimeters? Of, the, of their idea? Yeah. It's, it's, it is from the sea, from the Mediterranean, over to all the way to the east, to around Iraq. Yeah, the Tigris okay. and the Euphrates. So, so it cuts off on that like part with Egypt, but it cuts off and goes that way. Yeah, like from okay. Egypt. Well, the thing is, is that like the Sinai Peninsula is very biblical. Also, that's like where the Exodus story took place. So, right. for for some Zionists, even that's part of the Holy Land, of the Promised Land, yeah. and then it goes farther to the east. The 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 sacred sacred sites, the most sacred sites, are in Jerusalem for all three monoths. Well. Uh, for Christianity, that Jerusalem is the most sacred, right. in, because that's where Jesus was, was killed and resurrected, mm -hmm. as they say. And the Church of the Holy Sepulcher, where he was entombed, is in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. For Judaism, the, their temples had existed in Jerusalem. So Jerusalem is very important as well. And it's kind of easy to forget that Christianity was a sect of Judaism, because they seem like at odds all of the time, but they're actually very, very close. Yeah. And so is Islam. Islam is so close to Judaism and Christianity and does not see that it's a replacement. It sees that it's like the message that Arabs got, the exact same message that God gave to the lands in Palestine, also gave to Arabia down in the south. Oh, okay. Yeah, so, so Muhammad's flight, night journey to Jerusalem was like this coming together of, of welcoming the Arabs into the Abrahamic faiths, you know, like, so, so Jerusalem is really important to Islam too, mm -hmm. you know, so all, of, all three of these faiths have coexisted in Jerusalem, like everyone can live in, you know, can, can, can worship in their sites, you know. What we're seeing right now um, 
is what we've been seeing over the last couple of decades is Israel, the prime ministers, the military coming in to the sacred Muslim site, Al-Aqsa Mosque, mm -hmm. and acting like, instead of guests, acting like they're the landlords, just like walking in with their shoes, just completely disrespecting. And that was actually what launched the second intifada in September 2000 when Ariel Sharon mm -hmm. went into Al-Aqsa. October 7th, we get... Uh, Al-Aqsa storm. Mm -hmm. Al-Aqsa is the symbol of the way that Palestinians are expressing that Jerusalem is sacred to them, too. Mm -hmm. Whereas, like, Europeans, like, on medieval maps would show that Jerusalem is sacred by putting it in the middle of the world and then the three mm -hmm. continents. Um, the ways that we see the expression of the sacred from the Palestinian perspective, and not all Palestinians are Muslim, but a right. large, far more, like more than 96%, I believe, are Muslim. And the way that the sacredness of Jerusalem is expressed is a lot like through the photos of, of Al-Aqsa. Mm. That, you know, we saw it on the low rider yeah, uh, when yeah. we went to the action. And the one that's going around all the... the golden... Yeah, the golden cup. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. So that's Al-Aqsa. So just to get then to your original question like of October 7 because a lot of folks who are watching what's happening right now kind of just you know without knowing this deep history right. that mm -hmm. Israel was created on top of Palestine and has in Gaza for example those are refugees from the villages that are now Israeli settlements and they've been penned in like they ran away for safety during the war that created the state of Israel thinking that they'd go back home mm -hmm. and Israel has never allowed them to go back even though they have that right, even under international law, at this, in the same breath that the United Nations allowed Israel in as a member state, it told Israel, well, you need to allow the refugees in, but you know, at your earliest convenience, you know, mm -hmm. you know the, the UN. Suggest. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And it, so they have that right under, under international law, but it's, of course, where is the enforcement? Right. So with, with October 7th, 75 years of being penned in, and over the last 16 years, being under siege, because in, in Gaza and the West Bank, those are places that are the remaining 22% of Palestine, where a lot of refugees have been pushed into. There's a lot of camps in the West Bank, too. And there's a whole occupation in both places. It looks different in Gaza in that the occupation is on the perimeters, the sea, the air, like mm -hmm. just like, you know, penning in Gaza, there used to be settlements there, but Israel removed them in 2005 and then put them in the West Bank. And then after that was able just to carpet bomb Gaza without fearing that they would kill any Israelis. I, I think it's important to remember that days before October 7th, Ero Sharon gave that speech showing a map completely erasing Palestine. Yeah. Like that was very... Uh, compelling to, mm -hmm. to like it was. I don't remember if it was like four days before or five days before. Two weeks before. It was two exactly weeks, two okay. weeks. Mm -hmm. And and then uh, you know, uh, like, October seven. Okay. The plan in his speech is completely erasure. Completely. Mm -hmm. I love that you said Ariel Sharon because it's Be Benjamin Netanyahu. Oh, yeah. But I always yes. say Ariel Sharon <laughs> yes, too because they're these tyrannical yes. PMs, <laughs> the prime ministers, and they're like whatever. It's all the same, yeah, yeah, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Um, in the 90s. <laughs> I love it. You know, I, this is a true story. The first time I ever set foot in Palestine right. was in January 2006, and Ariel Sharon slipped into a coma. Oh wow! Yeah, and I, I don't, I don't take credit for it, but I really like the the <laughs> coincidence. Yeah. Um, but but it's funny because every time I talk about Netanyahu, I have to correct myself because I want to say Sharon. Yeah. Yes, two weeks before October seventh. I was about to say Sharon again. Yeah. Netanyahu was at the United Nations pre uh, presenting two maps, two sets of maps. One of them was a map of Israel 1948, except that it was all of Palestine. It wasn't right. even like the United, like the, the armistice lines from the war mm -hmm. that created the West Bank and Gaza. It was all Israel. Mm -hmm. So Palestine was gone. And then his next set of maps was showing all of the, the agreements, the peace agreements and normalization that Israel had already achieved from the neighboring countries like um, Sudan and, um, I mean, Egypt from a long time ago, Jordan, mm -hmm. and, and was about to normalize Saudi Arabia, which would be huge because mm -hmm. Saudi Arabia is trying to get 
um, is trying to de-Islamicize um, Hamid bin Salman, who is the ruler of the Saudi family now, kind of grew up watching like Hollywood, you know, the West, that kind of culture, and really wishes that, and, and understands that the oil of Saudi Arabia is finite, it's going to right. end. Mm -hmm. And so how in the world is he going to maintain this society or this, this kingdom that he has? And he's trying to create these raves, you know, he's trying to make it so that it looks like the United States. Saudi Arabia looks like the United States. And, for, and he also wants an agreement from the United States that it would come to its defense if, in case anything happens. Because Saudi Arabia feels very vulnerable by its neighbors who don't like it, including the Houthis mm -hmm. in Yemen. And so that was about to happen. Uh, Jordan next door is very... Uh, is the custodian of Jerusalem, has been the custodian uh, since the creation of the state of Israel, and um, depends a lot on Gulf money. So with Saudi Arabia normalizing Israel, the whole plan is that Jordan would hand to Saudi Arabia the custodial keys to Jerusalem, mm. and guess what would happen after that? No, no. They would hand them to Israel. Yeah, of course. Saudi Arabia would hand Jerusalem to Israel, mm -hmm. completely forsaking, betraying the Palestinian people. Yeah. So that was what was going to happen. Or that, that, that happened, uh, that speech happened two weeks before. It was very clear this normalization scheme is going to happen. The Palestinian struggle is done mm -hmm. because so much of the Palestinian struggle uh, has so much support from the Ummah, the Islamic Ummah, like the the whole community of Muslims mm -hmm. all over the world. Mm -hmm. And Saudi Arabia is supposed to be the leader of the Muslim world. And so if Saudi Arabia hands the keys of Jerusalem over to Israel, then Palestine is done. Mm -hmm. So this is the prehistory of October 7th. Mm -hmm. kind of, it, all, that, all that evidence shows the reason Saudi, Saudi Arabia has just done nothing, nothing to help Palestine. That's right. You know, um, I know they were trying to, to shut off, like, they were asking Al Jazeera out of, um, they're out of Qatar, I think, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, asking Qatar to shut down, you know, Al Jazeera, mm -hmm. because they're like, you know, they're, they're promoting, mm -hmm. you know, um, a bad look on, on, yeah. on Israel. Mm -hmm. um, yep. And, you know, earlier we were talking about, you know, the less human, because you hear Netanyahu say, call Palestinians dogs, and you know, all these, like, dehumanize them. Yeah. And the erasure, along with the dehumanization, um, in the me in mainstream media is a perfect formula to completely remove a people. That's right. Like, just erase them completely. You erase them, and the easiest way to do that is to convince others that they're erasable. Mm -hmm. They're disposable. We don't need them on this planet, right? And that's the dehumanization part. And that, I mean, hearkening to 500 years, right? The whole thing is you have rights if you're considered human. Right. And it's, again, the, the same uh, idea of manifest destiny. This is all. We are meant to be here. God gave us God this gave land. God gave us this land. Like, yeah. here was the same thing. Mm -hmm. You know, exactly. it, it was, we are the God's chosen one. So everyone else is not. Oh, yeah. The settlers who came from Europe they believe that this was the New Jerusalem, the city mm -hmm. on a hill, that's how they would talk. There's right. a really fantastic book that does this comparison by a Palestinian. His name is Stephen Salaita. It's called Holy Land in Transit, and it does a comparison about this, this, uh, this theology, the settler theology of the colonizers here and the colonizers of Palestine. So, it, it, you know, for me, when I was trying to, like, figure out what's, you know, how to, how to best accompany the Palestinian struggle... I was very much in the secular, on the secular vibe, thinking that, no, it's colonialism. It's not about spirituality, except that when you learn about colonialism here, it was very spiritual. It's not that it was a good spirituality, yeah. but it's still spiritual. Yeah. And, you know, um, terms like Capitol Hill, um, terms like, you know, architecturally, a lot of the buildings and Capitol buildings and states and the way they're placed on a hill with a dome, yeah. you know, has a lot to do with mimicking that Jerusalem. Yeah. Oh, yeah. making the Romans and all. that's why they call it like Greco Roman. Right. Oh yeah, like in DC. So mm -hmm. uh, the White House is Greek architecture. Capitol Hill is Roman, 
Mm-hmm. And then the Washington Monument, that long pillar, yeah. that's Egyptian. Mm-hmm. They yeah. completely mimic other empires. Yeah, yeah, and, and you know, I'm I'm really glad you came because you know, for La Voz del Pueblo, we, tr- we want to get as much information out there and and clarify a lot of things, but start with the basic, like what happened, and that's kind of yeah, I think, you know, what's going on, and then hopefully we can have another episode and dive deeper into, um, you know, what it is that, um, what, what continues to go on. Because yeah. things are changing so rapidly over there through all the violence and, um, you know, all the, the video that comes out of there, you know, the press and everything that comes out of there from the people on the ground. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And there's people out there, like, risking their lives to get the, the world to see what's going on. Yeah, and, you know, it was those Palestinian journalists risking their lives that made it possible for South Africa to even have this case of, Mm -hmm. you know, genocide against the state of Israel, which is, you know, it's at the UN, and so it's so limited, but just that the Palestinian narrative is on the record Mm -hmm. in 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 one of empire's own institutions, Mm -hmm. and will be there for as long as that institution is there is really important. And then for us to talk about, you know, from that, how do, how, what is, what is the solution is like always the question that we get. What is the solution? And for me, the whole world has to change. If Palestine's if Palestine going to be free, the whole world has to be free. Mm-hmm. Because to, to, to have this logic surrounding Palestine that it's a dog-eat-dog dog kind of world. You're either master or your slave, right? Like that leads mm-hmm. us into having to force Uh, it forces us into having to pick those positions. So Mm -hmm. if we can get away from a a logic of above and below and just be side by side with all of our beautiful differences, that's going to free us all. It's it's forcing the argument to exist within the parameters they created. That's right. That's right. So that's the, you know, the the difficulty. Mm -hmm. I think it's um, the more information people have, like, you know, during the, the trials and all that, you know, CNN, Fox, you didn't, they didn't air the South African argument, but they aired the Israeli argument, mm-hmm. you know, so. It's so clear. And um, so, you know, it, it, it's evident what is, what is being presented to us. Totally. So, yeah. you know, we, you know, I want to urge folks out there, you know, like, you know, read, research, you know, um, listen to shows like these that where we could have folks that come on and, um, you know, dig a little bit deeper and like help you know as much as we can get hum- get our humanity back collectively yeah so that's it um, just to wrap up because I know wow this time this one flew by <laughs> like I've been here several times this one went yeah. the fastest I this think was, this one really fast. uh, yeah just yeah exactly as you're saying is learning some more and I know that it's hard because it seems like there's so many things going on in the world and which one do you pick mm-hmm. right and I think that's how, what helps with that is us looking at what's the common logic and practice mm. and, and not having just to get uh, so bogged down on, on the details and the specificities because that's an infinite thing mm, to do. Right. So, thank you. Thank you, Kiki, for yeah. coming. And, um, you know, we want to, we should do, I think as time passes and new information comes out, mm-hmm. maybe you come on and do a... Uh, you know, another talk. Absolutely, and I'd love yeah. to know what uh, listeners, like, what you'd like us to cover. Like, mm-hmm. there's so much, and so if you can give feedback, that'd be the best. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I want to give a quick shout-out to Palacate Press. Yeah. You know, and... Um, you know, anything else? Yeah, Baliacate Press, um, the Fourth World War. We just published a translation, a collected translation of the Zapatistas writing on the Fourth World War that can also help us understand the last 30, 35 years of how we've all been struggling. So um, it's, free to, it's free to read online. You can also buy the book. Also, this Friday we have our book club, and if people want to come uh, at El Semillero. Yeah, that's right. And then in a few months we're going to have the 30-year Zapatista events. So. Yeah. And with that we leave you on, we're La Voz del Pueblo, we leave you on KQBHLP, Los Angeles, California, 11.5 FM, a community service of Boyle Heights Arts Conservatory, broadcasting live on your FM dial and streaming on LPFM.LA. This has been La Voz del Pueblo. I'm your engineer, Chico Hecat, signing off. Good night.